Digital has completely upended the business world, fundamentally changing the industry as we know it. Now it's less about brand building and more about convergence of the marketing and technology to guide digital uh, transformation. When it comes to finding partners as digital marketing continues to evolve, brands and in-house marketing teams need to look for those that understand the technology and strategy required to execute on digital transformation. Let's put, let's put it this way. True digital transformation requires a new breed of agency. Good afternoon, everybody. You are tuning in the Midday Show with Stephen Poon. I'm your host for this episode of Spotlight Dialogue series. Once again, in the virtual room with me are the regular team of the Special Interest Group in Creative Economy from Integrated Sustainability and Urban Creativity Center, acronym as ISUC, also known as ISOC, at Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation, APU. It's live on Facebook now and live on YouTube too. We have a great staff 
And a little surprise, I'm very excited because we have plenty to share today. Before we get to all of that, let's start on the topic, digital transformation for a creative agency. Our guest today, Imbaraj Supia, the founder of C, the founder and CEO of Pixar Works Creative, a boutique dig uh, digital agency based in Kuala Lumpur that provides full-scale digital solutions. Since 2006, Imbaraj grew Pixar Works from a home-based business to an agency capable of working with organizations across a diverse business landscape, from startups, SMEs, MNCs, to even government agency in Malaysia and abroad. He is hands-on and heavily involved in all aspects of the business from design, coding, to even production. In Baraj, is experienced in community development, consultancy and training, having consulted and trained various corporate clients and government agency. In Baraj also mentors many Malaysian startup and various growth stages to help them with business modeling and funding opportunities. He has been actively involved in developing the Malaysian startup ecosystem for the past 12 years as an ecosystem builder. And uh, his passion has always been about connecting people and creating real impact. Please welcome Imbaraj Supia. Hi, Imbaraj, how are you doing? Hi, Stephen. Oh, what a day, actually. <laughs> well, we are talking about digital transformation, but we're having a little bit of technical technicality. <laughs> so right. we finally set it down. Yeah. How are you doing, by the way? I'm good. I'm good. How are you okay. doing today? Okay. Not bad, not bad, actually. So let's get started then. So um, today, we quite a bit of things to do, especially we talk about digital transformation. I think this is the topic of, which is a very appealing to a lot of people nowadays, even the younger generation. So we are talking today about the digital leadership and um, an organizational readiness to get on the train for digital transformation. I think as we know that, understanding where they sit in appetite for change and their ability to make the changes that they want in order to move forward as an organization. Okay, if we were about to talk um, and to an expert like you in the digital transformation, so what question would we ask actually? So this will be really interesting, am I right? So, and lo and behold, we have gotten ourselves in contact with you from Pixar Works Creative. So Imbaraj, if you could just introduce yourself a little bit more than what I have just mentioned and let us know who you are and we are about to hear from as we go along with the dialogue. All right, Imbaraj. Uh, good afternoon guys. Uh, my name is Imbaraj, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, you can say I'm a tech entrepreneur based in KL. Uh, I think, you know, uh, our host today has read out uh, quite a bit of uh, my introduction. Uh, yes, uh, I run a creative agency now, Pixar Works Creative. So that's where, you know, uh, the bulk of my business is. Uh, creative agency, I think you guys know, we do anything and everything creative, mostly digital stuff. And also over the years, we have gone more digital. We used to do a lot of physical stuff and then we have, uh, we already did the digital transformation much earlier before the pandemic. Uh, so many of our projects now are digital. So digital marketing, you know, building websites, apps, uh, and you know, a lot of the digital campaigns. And also on the other side, I run a lot of startup and corporate programs as well. So we have another arm uh, called Pixel Apps where we do corporate innovation programs. So we call it corporate and startup innovation programs. So that's where we work with uh, many of our corporate clients to run uh, entrepreneurship related programs and startup related programs. Okay, yeah, your mind side is building as you're saying that because I recall many times it is happening. Okay, okay. Um, it's so great that you apply something so practical as far as your explanation, uh, which is uh, what you have involved to this uh, digital transformation and what it means to you. So I'm glad we are talking uh, uh, to a digital transformation expert today, which is uh, in Baraj. So, but if we think through that process, going from the manual, to the euphoria of the business key that you describe. I start to think about the business processes and, uh, and the types of the mindset changes and the process changes, especially that sound rather complex. It sounds like a big undertaking, am I right? So how can companies look at making something like that as simple as possible, simplifying the kind of the transformation? All right, simplifying digital. First, I wouldn't call myself an expert. I mean, I think we all are trying. Uh, we're trying our best. Maybe some of us have a bit more experience because we've done it, you know, uh, for a long time. For many people, digital transformation is very new. I think only when the pandemic hit, 
uh, people decided to look into digital transformation because before that they thought you know they don't need it right uh, for some of us in the industry I think being digital has always been part of our business and uh, over the years it has become such uh, to simplify the digital transformation process hmm, uh, I would say take it uh, one step at a time uh, because I think you need always uh, you need time to learn new things right uh, and you need time to adapt so you can't just digitize everything you can't take your whole business and say oh digital transformation now everything is digital it may yeah, not yeah, work you're right, yeah. because yeah. you can't disrupt your business right so yeah. while digital transformation is useful and very necessary now but i think it has to be one step at a time uh, where you look at your processes first and see okay which is the one you can digitize with the least disruption so i think that's the the approach that you need to take so it means let's get the things uh, the the easiest thing digital first right move it out of the way and then you look at the most serious processes and then you see okay which ones can we digitize and if we digitize will it continue the process or will it disrupt or will it improve right because if it doesn't improve or stay the same and make it easy for people or make it more efficient then it's actually not good right because we have seen over the years some businesses who try to make certain things digital but it doesn't work for them because some things are meant to be physical uh, but now you know because of the lockdown related issues and all right yeah. we are forced yeah, yeah. to go digital but yeah you have to really look at processes one step at a time and then see which ones you can digitize with the least disruption that way you can make your business more efficient and at the same time you don't like you know disrupt your business i think that's very important great for sure and, and really when you talk about things like breaking it down to the bite size pieces and then the next and the next piece of after that so in all your experience with all these different organizations you have been working with uh, those are the projects that you have been working with across the industry where do you think most businesses are right now so what stage of the of their digital transformation journey are most companies sitting in right now uh hard to say uh most companies in malaysia i think if you look at smes uh, i mean the reality right reality is right uh, most smes i mean many smes in malaysia don't even have an email address or don't even have their <laughs> own dot uh, com right they don't even have their own website you know so authentic uh, so, yeah. so we we have been quite you know uh, left back i mean we always sometimes focus on like clang valley right kl we look around mm -hmm. kl oh, everybody is digital connected everyone has a website everyone has an email but if you look look at malaysia as a whole it, it's it's still a big country right so the moment mm -hmm. you go outside of kl uh, outside of clang valley uh people are not as connected uh, or as or as tech savvy or as digital uh so you will see a lot of businesses that are running making money but they think they don't need a website uh, or no don't need an email so i think digital transformation we are still at a very early stage uh so now as people are forced to get into it i think uh, the popular thing now is of course sales first right because what the lockdown has done to us is it uh, has stopped us from going out and selling things uh, whether you're a retail business or you know or any kind of business uh, even if it's a service industry right you can't sell your services anymore so that's where i think uh, a lot of the digital transformation has come in uh, in the sales and uh, marketing part so people have gone into e-commerce uh, a lot of them you know has gone into platforms like lazada and shopee and all that uh, many people have invested money into building their own e-commerce uh, websites uh, you know some are just selling on whatsapp which previously they didn't do they thought they can just still sell things face to face uh, but now they've gone into digital sales so i think that's where most uh, smes are now focusing on uh, not really about the processes uh, or the administration or the accounts and things like that uh, even payroll you know i'm sure a lot of them are still using uh, uh, you know conventional ways of doing it uh, a lot of pay, pen and paper work uh, but mm -hmm. when it comes to trying to sell things i think they they push themselves to go digital in that sense i think that's where most of our smes are focusing on right now how do we push this idea especially for those that are sme from the rural area so uh, especially uh, um, we we are, I think we are referring this to the so called to the urban setting am i right so you're talking about so what is your advice what is your opinion about people like doing their kind of business in the different places they are not in the clang valley especially uh i think uh, it's not very hard it can be done right because i mean relatively malaysia is still more connected compared to you know other countries in southeast asia i think recently from mm. based on our some of our projects as well we realize i think only malaysia and singapore is the most connected here uh, if you look at all our neighboring countries uh, many of them have struggled even worse because during our lockdown right we have good broadband we are staying at home we work from home we can do live stream from home uh, but many yeah, of our, yeah. our neighboring countries uh, are struggling because they don't have mm. uh, the infrastructure that we have 
So relatively, mm-hmm. I think we're in a much better place. So even if you look at rural area, um, mm-hmm. uh, many of our Malaysian startups now, uh, they are expanding outside of Klang Valley. So previously, the focus is all Klang Valley. You know, you launch something like Grab, mm-hmm. uh, you launch something like a delivery service. Uh, everything is in Klang Valley. But I think over the last few years, we notice, yeah, it's going outside okay. of Klang Valley. Yeah. Would it be overcrowded actually if you if we only focus on Klang Valley, um, you know, not like some of the places like they every region, every provinces like they have their own business hub like China, like like United States, like those are the uh, places like in Holland as well. And although Holland is quite small, actually they have a different provinces, different states, they different region. They also have that kind of ecosystem. So don't you think it's a bit overcrowded? I'm not sure. Probably I'm just as a novice asking this kind of novice question. What is your what is your opinion about that? Uh, I wouldn't say overcrowded because I think the the bulk of it, the market is still in mm-hmm. KL, right? In Klang Valley. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. if you look at the population of Klang Valley uh, and how much money we have, if you look at you know the spending power, uh, definitely mm-hmm. Klang Valley is still where you know you you want to launch your business, right? First, uh, but there are some other cities where it's growing. I think we look at Johor. There are a lot of projects, mm-hmm. uh, initiatives mm-hmm. happening in Johor. In uh, especially like the Iskandar region, uh, even mm-hmm. a lot of government initiatives there to to build the entrepreneurship ecosystem and even the startup ecosystem. In Penang, we have a lot of uh, initiatives as well. We have a lot of exactly. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, but I think it, it must be led by the government. Things like this, like in terms yeah, of yeah. infrastructure and ecosystem, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, individuals like us, we can always support. We can do things at our own capacity. I mean, I've been a community builder for more than ten years now. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, building communities and and running communities in the startup ecosystem. Mm-hmm. It's not easy, right? It takes a lot yeah, of yeah, resources and time. Uh, and so for individuals, we can do as much as we can. Uh, but yeah, uh, in terms of government support, you know, whether federal or state level agencies, I mean, even now, mm-hmm. every state, I think we have agencies like we have federal, we have like MDAC and MAGIC and all those agencies yeah, looking yeah. at entrepreneurship. Uh, but even mm-hmm. the state level, right? We have so many like mm-hmm. in uh, Slango, we have SIDAC. Uh, mm-hmm. In Penang also, we have a few agencies, I mean, including like Invest Penang and all that. Uh, so mm-hmm. they do a lot of programs as well. Uh, so mm-hmm. when you have those kind of support uh, in terms of infrastructure and ecosystem from the government, uh, it mm-hmm. helps entrepreneurs to launch new things. So that mm-hmm. way we can actually uh, grow more cities around Malaysia. But if you look at it now, even in the East Coast, right? Even in uh, Kelantan, Sla, Terengganu, Pahang, there's also a lot of tech startups now popping up because during lockdown, they need delivery services as well. Maybe before mm-hmm. that, they're not ready, right? They're not looking at tech, using app and all that. But because mm-hmm. Malaysians are very connected, I mean, everybody has a smartphone now. Even if you're a farmer, you're in a rural area, chances are you have a, at least a, a simple Android phone. Right? Yeah, it's true. Well, they connect to 4G. So we are well connected. But in terms of mindset, I think if people realize the importance and, and how the, the digital you know, services can help you, then slowly they will come on board. Uh, but that it's takes true. Time, we right? have, Yeah, it's true. We have the findings, actually. Um, I can't remember when is the finding. There was a research about the Malaysian, uh, the, um, the the usage of the internet, right, for Malaysian is quite heavy. We are yeah. one of the top, I think, top five in the world, actually. So, yes, yes. Also, you, you, media. We are one of the top <laughs> yes. social media users. Yeah, we are, we, are, we are top of the list, actually. So, unbelievable. Yeah. So, I think we, we are, we are kind of like, we are the real digital citizens, put it this way. Yes, you are right. A big piece that you are talking about this with the buy-in and other phrasing. But it's essentially the same. I like to hear your thought on trying them together, especially. It's very well documented, or those are the uh, uh, those are the uh, statistic finding as well. That you need the culture shift for the successful digital transformation. It can't be just from the top. I think as it, as um, only when you mention from the government, government is the leeway. It has to be driven as the entire mindset shift across the organization. From my point of view, so since we are asking. Um, digital transformation expert like you, if you can maybe talk to us a little bit more about a culture shift versus a buy-in or even connecting them, it would be really great to hear uh, hear your thought. Uh, I think for an organization, right? I mean, if you speak about a private organization, uh, mm-hmm. the, the culture shift definitely has to start from the top, from the founders, mm-hmm. the owners of mm-hmm. the business. Uh, you know, if you because if they if they don't buy, it, if they don't believe in it, it's not going to work, right? I mean, something. Let's look at something very simple, right? As simple as punch card in an office. How many Malaysian SMEs can run without implementing punch card in the office? Because that does not only require technology; that requires trust, right? For example, your bosses have to trust the staff 
that they will come to work on time without a punch card and get their work done. And the employees has to respect the job enough or their employers enough to respect that uh, system and say, oh, whether punch card or not, I will come to work on time. I will get my job done on time. Uh, so if a company can't even do that, how do you trust people to work from home then, right? Then suddenly a pandemic hits. You need to work from home. So that kind of shift now is bigger, right? But if even pre-pandemic, for example, in my office, we have never implemented punch card, right? For the last uh, 15 years I've been doing business, I don't have a punch card system. Uh, my staff can come into the office and go whenever they want. Uh, so there's only two things I tell them, right? So in my organization, so if I can speak for myself, there's only two things I tell my staff, especially from the day I, I hire them. You have to finish your work on time, right? Deadline, very important. So what you do, I don't care, right? Whether you work at night, daytime, morning, afternoon, if you want to watch YouTube, do it, right? If you need to go as to the As long as the work is done, isn't it? As long as the yes, work right? is done. Because, you know, sometimes right. uh, you have to take like half day leave to go to the post office. You know, you know there are yeah, companies yeah. like that, right? Uh, yeah, you yeah, need to take leave to go to the clinic to, to get some uh, medicine. But like, no, for yeah. example, in my team, you don't need that, right? You can go send your parents to the bus station, to the airport, uh, anytime during working hours, as long as you get your work done. But the second thing is the quality. Because just getting the work done is not important, right? You need to maintain yeah. the quality. But there's one thing yeah, I've yeah. realized over the years. Uh, even if you don't meet the deadline, clients will understand as long as you deliver the quality or better than what they expect. If you send your work on time or delayed a bit, but the work is like really bad, you know, clients don't want it, right? Uh, but if you tell clients, okay, sorry, we're a bit delayed. We need a bit more time to get it done. But then when you deliver something and it's really like excellent, clients will love it, right? They will forgive you for the delays. Uh, so to me, these are the two thing, uh, important things. Get work done on time. That's very important. So, but even if you can't do it, the ultimate thing is the quality of your work. So it doesn't matter whether you deliver a product or a service, as long as you maintain your quality. So now we're looking at like, you know, working from home, right? So if your entire team or a company has to work from home, quality is still important. You can't tell the client, oh, sorry, our quality is down because we are working from home. Clients are not going to pay for it, right? Because ultimately they're paying the same price, whether you work from home or you work from a factory or an office. Uh, so these are the two things that are for me is, is the most important. Everything else I think is negotiable, right? Coming to office, mm. punching card, MC. Like in my company, I don't have such thing as MC. Uh, my <laughs> staff just has to watch that and say, they're not feeling well. Squig off from the dictionary, no MC, <laughs> no medical yeah. certificate. So, so my staff, if they're not feeling well, they wake up in the morning, they have a headache, they don't come to office, right? But most of them, what they do, as long as they are feeling well, they, they work from home. So even if they are not feeling well, they don't need an MC because they, they know the flexibility. Are you informed but, in that case? Are yes, you informed? So all, all they need is to just to inform me. And I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they have something urgent to do, of course, they will put that additional effort to just finish it from home. You right? know, this is this is, a, this is rather looking at the mentality. You know, sometimes, right, uh, some of the people abuse that kind of system idea. So yes. become, yes, uh, I'm not sure about, I believe there is always the people, a group of people, right? Minority, we call this, right? They don't, they don't understand the idea of this kind of work from home. So they, they kind of abuse the system of you know, uh, doing other things, uh, like, yeah. which is you can see the reducing of the quality, you know, so you don't get what they're giving thousand excuses not to do things and things like that. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether you see things surrounding because I've been observed actually. Sometimes you know, from other places, I see people behaving in a very strange way. So how do you evaluate? How how do you evaluate this? Yeah, so it's it's not easy. I mean, definitely, it's not an easy <clears throat> thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said earlier, right? Because something like this requires both sides to mm -hmm. be responsible, right? I mean, as an mm -hmm. owner, you need to trust your staff. But at the same time, as a staff, you need to also trust your own uh, employers and also respect the job, right? If you have a task, you have a role, you have a responsibility to play. Like you said, if during working hours, I'm, I'm in the mm -hmm. cinema watching a movie and suddenly my boss <laughs> called me, hey, where's the where's this thing I need you to submit? And you're like, oh, sorry, I'm in, I'm in the cinema. It's not going to work, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, definitely it requires both sides. So that means uh, the employees has to be ready for this as well. So it starts from the top yeah. to me because if the top mm -hmm. doesn't agree with it, then the whole thing will fail. So it starts from the top, but as it comes mm -hmm. down, every level of the, the company or, or an organization, you have mm -hmm. to you know, be in this, right? You can't say, oh, because I'm working from home, I can't adapt to it. Now, if you can't, cannot adapt to it, then you have to do something else. So to me, if, if an employee can't do it, right? If you can't mm -hmm. respect that working hours, because although you're working from home, working hours is working hours, right? So during working hours, mm -hmm. if I call you mm -hmm. and you don't pick up the phone, that means you're not working. Uh, 
just oh. looking for more doesn't make you sleep, right? <laughs> oh. uh, but, okay. but like I said, of course you can do other things, right? You may want to go to the oh, bank, yeah. you may want to go to yeah. the post office during working hours. But you can always, you know, inform, right? Like, mm. oh, boss, mm. I won't be available for a few hours. I have to get something mm. done, I'll be back. Mm. And then I will submit your work. So I think the other thing is, I think, communication. I think that's key. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, true. Yes, communication. When we work from home, we use mm. a lot of uh, tools, right? So, for example, yeah, right. uh, we use a lot of chat-based applications. Uh, mm. We use uh, file sharing applications. We have project mm. management tools. So I think working from home comes with all these other things as well. You need uh, a lot of, which is all part of the digital transformation, right? You need a lot of these mm. digital tools to assist mm -hmm. you to do all this work because the communication mm. is important as well. Because we, if you don't have that constant communication, and mm. then if you don't have things like you know Microsoft Teams mm -hmm. uh, to communicate, to have meetings, uh, then of course it's very hard to keep that team together. Uh, but to me, it requires a lot of uh, 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 a lot of uh, cooperation from both sides. It's not just about the bosses telling the staff or forcing them to do something. It's also mm -hmm. about the team rising mm -hmm. up to it and say, okay, now we are forced to work from mm -hmm. home because of a mm -hmm. pandemic, because we have all these issues. Uh, but mm -hmm. so how do we now work together and still get our work done? Because that is your responsibility. If you're getting paid to do something as an employee, you have the responsibility to get the work done as well. So you can't just sit at home and say, oh, there's a pandemic going on, so I'm not going to do my work. Then you'll mm -hmm. probably lose your job, which also happens to a lot mm -hmm. of people, right? Uh, mm, yeah, yeah, you're true. Because yeah. when you look at people who lose their jobs because of pandemic, mm -hmm. I don't think uh, all of them lost their jobs because of irresponsible uh, employers. I think it's also because some employees just can't adapt to this. They can't adapt mm, to the new norm. The well. mindset, yes, really. Yeah. Yes, so well, if you're at right. home and you are not mm. doing the work, then your mm. employers are going to let you go and hire somebody else who can do the work. Because at the mm. end of the day, right, like I said, the work has to be done. Otherwise, mm, yeah, you yeah. won't have customers or clients who will pay you money. Mm. That, that's no business. Mm. <laughs> yes, you're right, Imbarat. Uh, so yes, you are talking about the mindset shift like that. I think this is a really helpful tips and the reminders for keeping the right type of the mindset during this transformation, not which is a fall back into the old habits. Yes, you're right. So if we, um, if we are able to come back out of the bit to have an organizational view, what do you think some of the biggest roadblocks mid-side private companies? for instance, are facing when they are trying to push through this digital transformation journey? Uh, some of the biggest roadblocks. Mm. I mm. think, uh, first I would say cost. Cost is definitely a big roadblock, uh, especially for SMEs, right? Look, looking mm -hmm. at SMEs, whenever mm -hmm. you want to implement something, I mean, even if you want to implement a digital tool, right? Not everything is mm -hmm. free. There are a lot of digital yeah. tools that require, I mean, even if you look at, you know, like chat apps like this, mm -hmm. or project management tools, uh, even a HR tool, right? Like an online payroll system, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have a, a few hundred staff, it's going to cost you a bit. So all these digital tools also will add cost to the business. Uh, but that's in the admin side, right? I uh, look at operation. Uh, so now you say, okay, I want to do digital marketing now. Uh, now you have a whole new allocation for digital marketing, right? For digital advertising, digital marketing, you need an entire a whole new team to run it for you. Uh, sales, right? If you want to do digital sales, now you need an e-commerce setup with online payment gateway. Uh, things like that. So all these things, uh, of course, some can be done for free or with minimal cost, uh, but there will be a lot of things that will cost you as well, right? I mean, something simple like you need a camera to do work. Uh, I mean, this something simple like this is going to cost you 15,000 ringgit. Uh, so if you're a micro SME, 15,000 ringgit is a lot of money to buy a camera, right? Uh, it's just an example, right? It can be anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, an equipment mm -hmm. that you require to go digital, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. not everybody can do that. The other thing is, I think the uh, the workforce themselves, right? Like I said earlier, uh, can the workforce adapt to this new norm? Uh, if you say digital transformation, uh, is your workforce ready? You know, are they tech savvy enough? Do they all have a, a laptop at home? Do they all have a, a working, uh, you know, smartphone? Uh, and do they all have 4G connection? Because there are people also who have smartphones, but they can't afford data, for example, right? They can't afford like 4G uh, postpaid. They use prepaid. And then when the prepaid runs out, they are disconnected. Uh, so these are all issues as well. So I'm talking about Malaysia in general, right? Not this. If you think about just Klang Valley, you may think, hey, everybody's connected. Now everybody has Wi-Fi. Uh, you can go anywhere and just connect free Wi-Fi, things like that. But if you look at whole Malaysia, I think the, the challenges are then very different, right? If you average it across the country. Uh, so yeah, definitely a lot of challenge with the workforce themselves. So are they tech savvy enough? Because, I mean, also, right, just because you have a smartphone, you can maybe use Facebook. But that doesn't mean you're very tech savvy, right? It doesn't mean you can use all kinds of digital applications. It's just it accessibility, mean, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. But the mm. to me, the foundation is there, right? Like you say, we are all mm. pretty connected uh, relatively compared mm. to, I mean, our neighbors in the region, we are definitely more connected. 
uh, in terms of social media use, I think we are one of the top in, in the world now. Uh, but yeah, so that has given us the foundation. But now it still requires more training. So for a company to become digital, definitely your workforce needs training. They need to be more tech savvy. They need to be more web savvy. Uh, you know, and then things like cybersecurity and thing come to place that, you know, you don't lose money online. You want everybody to come online and come digital, but you also make sure they are ready for it, right? And they're prepared for it. Uh, so these things, yeah, definitely will, will be quite hard for many organizations. For some, maybe it's easy, uh, especially some who are uh, quite digital already, right? Even before the COVID pandemic, uh, there are many companies who are very digital. For example, uh, an agency like us, we are very pretty digital, right? We are ready to go. Pandemic, work from home. Day one, we are already working from home because we already know how to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Working yeah. From home. Yeah, so personally, I've been working from home for 15 years. I mean, have my home office, right? So, you know, a lot of people, once the lockdown hits, that's when they went to Lazada, decided to buy a webcam. They decided to, you know, get a proper broadband at home. They, some of them had to buy a table. I'm like, no, I, yeah, yeah. my home office is ready, right? I can just work from home anytime. Uh, so things like that. So yeah, I think the challenges are very different. Uh, it depends mm. on where you were before all mm. these pandemic issues started. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, it definitely will take a bit of cost uh, and uh, a lot of, I think, effort from the, the workforce as well. Your team, your mm -hmm. staff at every level, right, has to be ready for, for that digital transformation. Otherwise, you'll be spending a lot of time training them. Uh, you'll be mm -hmm. spending a lot of time and effort and also maybe money. You need to send your staff for training now. Uh, so that, of course, adds back to the cost again. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, you're right. Mm, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's not easy. So when people say like, oh, why not we go digital? It's easy to say. Uh, but yeah, you know, yeah, 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 right. Okay. Um, Imbaraj, I'm, I'm going to tack on what you just said. I'm glad that we are having this session today because you gave us some of the great tips just now on what the first step would be to overcoming some of the various roadblocks that those who may be facing for their organization. Um, thank you for those notes. So what about companies that were the early adopters? So like you mentioned that early on, so those who pre-pandemic, were all about the digital transformation. They were all gung ho about let's do it, like what you just said. Let's transform our business. But then, of course, they switched gears to just hanging on over the last ten to twelve months. How would they know if their strategy is still relevant? So, what do we say to those people who work so hard to build a strategy, and maybe we were close to pulling the trigger, and then, of course, they had to literally switch gears without any option. I think uh, strategy, I mean, strategies are never uh, long term, right? Uh, you always have to reevaluate and re-strategize. Uh, so even if you had like amazing digital strategies before the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, definitely it's not going to be uh, valid now, right? Uh, because whether pandemic or not, uh, any kind of business related strategies you have, you have to constantly uh, evaluate, reevaluate and, and re-strategize, right? Uh, and also sometimes people say, you know, don't break it. Yeah, but uh, don't fix it if it's not broken or something, right? Uh, but yeah. that may not be the case because sometimes you need to optimize and improve. So even if something is working, you have to constantly optimize and keep improving. Otherwise, you, you won't grow, right? You will just be at the same level. Uh, so yeah, strategy pre-pandemic, if you had a great strategy or not, I think it doesn't matter. Uh, we always have to look at where we are now. Uh, I mean, in terms of business strategies, I think every three months, every six months, it's always good to reevaluate. Uh, where you are and what's your goal and whether you need to re-strategize or not or you need to change your goals or not. Uh, that's, I think, as a business, you have to constantly evolve, right? You cannot just stay in one place. Uh, yeah, so for those who have no digital strategies, now you're forced to. You have no choice. You just have to jump in it and, and do some kind of digital transformation. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind, right? If you keep waiting yeah, yeah. for everything to go back to normal like before, I mean, we will go back to uh, some level of normalcy, I think, with the vaccination program and all that. But it won't be the same, right? It won't be 100% like how we used to live. So definitely you will need some kind of digital transformation to adapt to whatever new norms that we're going to have, let's say, next year. Uh, but uh, for those who have strategies, great, right? If you're already at some kind of digitization, I think a lot of uh, big corporates have uh, already started, like you said, right? They already started the digital transformation process even before the COVID pandemic, right? Uh, they've already had like, you know, Microsoft Teams, Zoom subscriptions. Mm -hmm. They've had like uh, online uh, collaboration tools. Uh, you know, something as basic as G Suite, right? Google Suite. Uh, people have already started using like Google Docs and Google Slides and spreadsheets and things like that. And so that multiple people can work together. Or a lot of other project management tools, right? I think the popular ones, you know, Trello, Basecamp and things like that. Uh, 
so yeah, people uh, already started using that Slack and all these other chat apps. Uh, so for those who already had those kind of digital transformation, I think they were a bit more prepared, right? Now they're a bit more ready. Of course, they had to still continue and do better. Uh, even for someone like us, we were always digital. Uh, most parts of my businesses were digital, but there are there were parts were very physical, right? For example, when we do programs, our corporate innovation programs, uh, many of those programs are very physical programs, physical events, where mm -hmm. I can take my whole team, go, you know, in uh, physically to the location and run an event or run a program or a training. Uh, but now, you know, we, we do it virtually, right? So this is our <laughs> studio setup where we mm -hmm. run most of our virtual programs now, mm -hmm. uh, which are still as important as big. Uh, many of our clients are big corporate clients. Uh, but they understand, right? The program has mm -hmm. to go on. The, the, the you know, life has to go on, right? So we still yeah, yeah, you're right. Actually, <laughs> we still have to run these events. We still have yeah. to run these programs. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have uh, objectives that we want to achieve. Uh, but now, how do we then make it digital? So we try our best. So even for us, I think last year after the the lockdown was re uh, reopened, right? After I think about did you realize that we are we are getting more creative? And also sustainable uh, yes, as well. In the <laughs> so so we, we had to figure out a lot of new things as well. Uh, things mm, like, you know, mm, uh, virtual mm. event platforms, for example. I mean, mm. you can't run a, I mean, you can have a meeting in Microsoft Teams, but you, you know, you can't run a, a conference, for example, right? Mm, uh, you can't run mm. a virtual hackathon uh, or a competition. Mm. Uh, so then we had to explore a lot of things. We had to test a lot of new uh, applications, mm. a lot of new platforms, and mm. uh, test out a lot of things. So over the last, I think, uh, one year we have done a lot of experimentation a lot of testing we've uh, discovered a lot of new things and now we mm -hmm. are way more digital than before uh, mm -hmm. but yeah but you know some things you just can't digitize if you want to send somebody a t-shirt you still have to send somebody a t-shirt right <laughs> so those things are we just do it in a different way isn't it <laughs> yeah okay, so last um, time, you know you come to a counter, you give them a goodie bag. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> now they have to put it in a box and post it to them. Uh, yeah. so, you know? <laughs> well, I'm not sure about looking at the sustainable context, actually. Are we sustainable enough to put it on this thing? Because it's more material to be used, you know. Okay, um, yes. I like yes. the, yeah. It's true. And I like the optimism you have just put forward. That was really great. Okay, we, we have talked about the uh, don't be afraid to look at a transformation, like what you say. We had talked about uh, don't be afraid to dust off your transformation. So we had talked about taking a look at the world around you. And then we even had talked about what are some of those that work law and how to overcome them. So um, we have mentioned budget and culture change, which is uh, all these things just now talking about how much does it cost and all those are the camera, for instance. Now, if we have a company, for instance, that agrees and say, yes, we know we need to do this. And yes, the value is there yes we need it for our business but now we see there are some options what are some of the best way to budget and finance this type of the transformation do you look at the capital expense with on-premises technologies do you look at the operating expenses with so many things like as a service is it hybrid for instance how do you decide which is right for your company uh, for budgeting, I think uh, uh, it's a bit hard as well, right? I'm, I mean, I'm not an expert in this. I'm not an accountant. Uh, it's good to always talk to an accountant. Uh, if you have an accountant <laughs> in the company, I think uh, if you have a CFO, for example, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They will be the you know best people to sit and have this discussion with. Uh, but I think uh, as, a, as a founder, as a, if you're the uh, owner of a business, uh, the first thing you have to look at is the, is the revenue that you're still making, right? Uh, I mean, if you're still making revenue, then you can always budget for this digital transformation as part of that, right? If you have still projects coming in, so if let's say your physical projects are now, now virtual or digital, uh, so money is still coming in. So you can always allocate a budget that's going to help you to be more digital, right? Uh, but if it's a projected revenue, is a bit tough. If you want to start something new and then you want to invest in a lot of like equipments and gears and tools and trainings to hope to make some money, can be done. I mean, as, a, as an entrepreneur, sometimes you have to take a lot of calculated risks. Uh, but yeah, there's no guarantee, right? You may invest a lot of money into setting up something, you know, to go digital, but what if the revenue is not there? What if you don't close the, the projects? Uh, then it's risky. Uh, but in terms of like administration work, right? Like digitizing your businesses, your operations, your accounts, your admin stuff. I think that uh, should be okay because because of the lockdown, we also have saved a lot of money in terms of operations, right? I mean, maybe you still have to pay your office rental, but there are a lot of additional mm -hmm. costs. For example, your utilities may have gone down. Uh, you may not be buying food for your offices anymore for your team, right? Your coffee machine probably you haven't reloaded in one year. Uh, 
so there are a lot of things, right? I mean, there, I think there are a lot of other costs, like overhead costs that you may have saved. So that money may now go to subsidizing your digital tools, right? So whatever physical things that you have saved, uh, now you are uh, putting into the digital side. So I think in that sense, uh, maybe uh, costs won't be an issue uh, because you can basically move around the cost, right? Because otherwise, if you are running a physical business, everybody's coming to office, you would have spent all this money anyway on a lot of these things. But now, wherever you're saving, you're then moving it to uh, another digital uh, uh, solution, right? Uh, but like the other things, uh, if you have bigger investments, right? If you need to set up a studio, for example, you need to do digital uh, events or conferences, and you have to set up a studio uh, from scratch, uh, that's going to set you back a bit, right? It's, gonna, it's costly to, you know, audio video equipment and things like that are not cheap. Uh, but then it also depends on your revenue. Have you locked in the revenue? If you have closed the deals with clients to, to do these programs, you know how much money is coming in, then I think it's okay. Uh, you can easily budget. So when, is the, when, when should we have it first? Do we have the client deal first or should we have the so-called budget first? What is your advice here? Uh, I mean, you, you have to do your costing, but oh, I right. wouldn't, like for me, like I'm relatively a very small uh, SME, right? Small company. Mm. Uh, so I can't afford to just simply go and throw money and invest into something without confirmation that I'm going to make the money. Uh, mm. So for me, if I'm doing something new, uh, I always will close the deal first, right? Uh, mm. As long as you know, I can convince the, my clients that I have the capabilities, I have the experience to do this, mm -hmm. uh, and if this is how much it's going to cost. And if it's going to cost a bit more because now it's virtual or digital and uh, but of course, in, in one set, the clients will be saving a lot of money, right? If you do a virtual mm. program, for example. Uh, Cost-wise, of course, way cheaper. Running a virtual summit, a virtual conference, a virtual training is way cheaper than doing a physical event, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So as long as you can convince the client this is the right budget and you have the capabilities to do it and the clients are convinced, you, you lock the deals, then you can take the money and say, okay, now I need to buy a camera, I need to buy a studio, right? I need to buy this and buy that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can do something like that. So usually for me, that's how I do my budgeting. When I'm budgeting a project, uh, I will mm -hmm. go on project basis. Of course, as a mm -hmm. company, you have your 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 full you know costing right to run the business mm -hmm. for a year at least. Uh, but I also do on project basis. So whenever I sign a big project for a big client, then I will see specifically from that revenue of that project, then how much can I spare to reinvest into the business? Because every project has a profit margin, right? We know the profit mm -hmm. margin. And of course, cost of running that particular project. But there are some things that you have to invest for long term, right? So you take part of that uh, profit and you reinvest into tools and equipment, which you can use for long term. So that means when you do the next project, a similar project, you already have everything. So now your profit margin becomes bigger because you no longer have to uh, you know, spend that money again. So sometimes mm -hmm. you have to calculate uh, which kind of investments which can do long term. Because when you buy something mm -hmm. like a camera, uh, that's mm -hmm. going to you know, last you for five to 10 years. You buy a MacBook, mm -hmm. it's going to last you for 10 years. Uh, so for 10 years, uh, you know, that's going to bring you more ROI, right? Uh, return of mm -hmm. investment. Uh, so those kind of things, yeah? You have to look at uh, uh, how you can maximize that, that revenue that you're making. But if you just mm -hmm. want to focus on profit alone and you don't look at reinvesting some of that into uh, your business, then you'll get stuck because then you'll be depending on every time money come in and then you do something. Every time money comes in, you do something. Uh, but yeah, definitely... Locking in clients and projects, revenue, I mean, closing in revenue is the, the most important thing for an SME. Uh, projection and all aside, you know, it's nice to have all these revenue projections. But, you know, until you close the deal, you sign the contract, money comes in, right? I mean, that's the best way for a company to survive. When you, when you mention, uh, of course, when you mention about virtual uh, project, it's going to be cost cheaper than the physical. Um, of course, uh, yes, I, I do understand. And also, we, we uh, I know because the difference between the physical and virtual, definitely physical experience is different from the one you do it virtually. So sometimes, right, um, I mean, for me as a human, right, I'm, I'm very human uh, and, and humane about uh, what I do need to be more um, humanistic. So which is, uh, I always like to, uh, which is uh, interact with people. Uh, what if uh, you're still having that kind of audience, probably your clients, they still like that kind of interaction. Do you think that they will run behind uh, this phenomenon because uh, they still couldn't be evolved themselves to become more digital? What is your take about this? You mean in terms of the experience? Yeah, yes, the physical experience and the virtual experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, of course, you, you can never compare, right? Physical experience is mm -hmm. amazing. Having a face-to-face, -face, uh, just a chat mm -hmm. or a coffee, right? You're holding a mm -hmm. coffee 
and having a chat with someone mm. it's you know way better than anything you can do virtual uh, but mm-hmm. i think our challenge is to to how can we replicate that experience as much as possible mm-hmm. you can't do it 100% but we try our best to replicate that as much so when we do our programs for example uh, of course we know we put 200 people in a building we run a program together it's a whole different atmosphere and vibe uh, but so we then look at okay what kind of tools can we use now what kind of virtual platforms can we use where you can still bring those kind of elements right like in a physical event you want to sit at a table and have a chat with your, mm-hmm. your team members so in mm-hmm. virtually like for example in microsoft teams you don't have the same experience but there are like for example uh, virtual conference platforms right uh, that we use where there are virtual tables so when you log in and go to the uh, event platform there's a virtual table now you click on a table you launch a video chat like this and you talk to people at the table and then you get bored of them you just leave the table you can jump to another table uh, so in a way you kind of recreate the same experience where i would go to an event i go to a table i say hello to some friends and then i might want to go to another table and say hello to some friends mm. uh, we try to recreate the same kind of experience not the same mm-hmm. but try to give people something similar right something they used to like if mm-hmm. i walk into a, a hall i attend a conference what do i mm-hmm. do first obviously i'm going to look for faces that i know right uh, familiar faces i'm going to look for friends i'm going to go to the section where they everybody's having coffee and go like if i meet some friends i'm going to say hello to people i know first and then yeah, people yeah. i know will introduce and then usually somebody you know will introduce you to another friend right that's yeah, how yeah. you network Yeah it's so true it's a bit PR to, world yeah. there yeah so we try to give people the same kind of experience online as mm. much as possible so that way right uh, mm. people when they join our virtual programs they're like oh, okay mm. yes it's different but i still get to do a bit of the things that i can do physically i can do it mm. here uh, mm-hmm. so i think that's the approach because at the end of the day it's always the human experience a uh, tools mm. technology yeah, yeah, right. it just mm. to help us but mm. if those tools and technologies that we are using does not replicate the same experience that you can do in a physical uh, mm-hmm. setup and uh, mm-hmm. then people won't like it because now it's something different right it's not the same uh, but if i can say hey i go physically i get this 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 thing done but now i come to your virtual setup i kind of get the same things done but in a virtual way they will still have that same kind of excitement so i think that human experience and excitement is try, what we try to 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 give to to our participants and even our clients and all that Uh, and you know we try our best right we, like i said it's never the same you can't do it 100% yeah yeah exactly right? yeah humanity right is the key here you try your best huh? yeah humanity is the always a key here okay um i'm wondering and I'm pondering over my mind now let's say uh, for companies they are all set and ready to go they are ready to pull the trigger and they are ready to go from strategy development to actual execution so they are ready to transform for instance they are making their first few step so what are some of the signs that company may need to go back and eat and, and iterate and adjust and uh, if i have the business going through the transformation and uh, i start to make the changes uh, what are some of the those telltale signs that maybe we need to go back and take a second look maybe this may not be the best first step forward What is your advice? Uh of course I think number one you have to look at revenue. If you're not making mm-hmm. money then something is wrong. <laughs> so you know <laughs> if you if you go digital mm-hmm. or you transform something but you're like not making money still not making money. Uh mm-hmm. then definitely something is wrong right that's I think the number one sign. Uh if a business is not making money you're doing something wrong or, or whatever you're doing is not working then you have to immediately go back to the drawing board and try to re-strategize. I think the other one is uh the feedback from your clients. I think to me uh one of the you know most important things about running a business is what your mm-hmm. clients or your customers think because at the end of the day uh, you know they are the ones paying for it right uh, mm, yeah yeah you're right yeah. the one paying for your services and your products and they i think they are the most important people so one thing is for your internal team right your your workforce your staff and all mm-hmm. to adapt and to 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 get on board to this digital transformation but then how does your customers feel your clients feel So if let's say for example now you have done a digital customer support system for example which you didn't have before uh but is that being done well right now your customers use your digital support system do they still get the same experience do they get the mm-hmm. same help uh mm-hmm. do you solve their problems if not then your digital system is not working right now you have to mm-hmm. re-strategize and say hey may mm-hmm. yeah of um of course uh, now if i'm going through this transformation 
and uh, I'm ready to roll. For instance, which departments in your experience have been able to train uh, uh, to transition uh, the smoothest? Are there some departments that uh, have done a better job than others, or is it some personnel types, or is it some industry types? So, where do you see some of the smoothest transition? Can you give us any insight on this? Yeah, I think the industry definitely, uh, you know, uh, is a, is a mm. big factor, right? Because mm. some industries are just too physical. I mean, manufacturing, mm. how do you digitize manufacturing, right? Uh, mm -hmm. All the glove companies have been operating since last year, right? You can, you know, make gloves from home uh, or you can, you know, digitize the, the, the product. It has to be, mm. you have to go to a factory mm -hmm. and physically, it's physical labor, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But I think in terms of like a, a regular SME, for example, if you look at department wise, I think the easiest one will be the admin side. Any administrative related or yep. accounts related uh, mm -hmm. departments, I think they'll mm -hmm. be the first, the easiest to digitize because we have a lot of HR tools, uh, you know, payroll accounting tools, uh, you know, as simple as something like G Suite, just to get, you know, a spreadsheet on a browser. Uh, many of these work can be easily digitized, which previously also could have been done, but just people didn't bother, right? I mean, many of these things, uh, mm -hmm. something like banking in a check, I mean, you can do digital transfer now, right? But, you know, people are still signing checks and banking in at the machine when you can just do yeah. an online transfer to your, to your clients. <laughs> to, be uh, honest, like to be honest, I'm still doing that. I have to I go into the bank and I'm still doing that. I just, I can't get rid of this kind of old habit. So yes. I still... No, actually, uh, last, week, <laughs> last week, somebody just banked in a check for me. So <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I haven't uh, received the check. Reason. Yeah, I for, for some reason, check, I still put it in the last few years. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, last yeah, week, uh, somebody still banked in a check. So yeah, things are still like that, uh, mm. which can easily be digitized, right? Uh, payment, online mm. payment, uh, payroll, things like that. Oh, and mm. all kind of administration work, right? Any any mm. administration work in a in a company, uh, mm. you know, everything can be email. You don't need to send letters, things like that. Uh, but uh, okay, the other one will be marketing, marketing and sales. Mm. Uh, of course, mm. you know, uh, physical marketing, sales, good, very helpful but also relatively easier to digitize, right? You can easily do digital uh, marketing now uh, on social media, Google and all that. Uh, and digital sales as well, right? Instead of coming to a counter and buy your product, I can just buy your product on Lazada, Shopee or on your own website. Uh, I can check out, pay using uh, my e-wallet or my bank or even my credit cards. So all that relatively easier to do. Uh, I think operations will be the hardest, operations and manufacturing. Uh, if you have some kind of fabrication or manufacturing as part of your business, definitely you can't digitize it. Uh, you know, then you have to still work as how you used to do with proper SOPs, uh, but you can't just digitize the process. Uh, if you are very... Just, it cannot apply to 100% of your business. I think many SMEs in Malaysia, we still have a lot of physical components. Uh, unless you're a tech startup, like a tech startup, you can 100% run from, uh, you know, digitally, right? But even mm -hmm. then, if you notice many of the successful startups in Malaysia, they have a lot of physical components. Where so if you take, you know, one of our biggest names, of course, right? Something like Grab that came out of Malaysia. Uh, they're an app, right? They're an app where you can book a car, but you still have to go and meet somebody who drives a car. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, yes, you're right. Impact, yeah, you still need to onboard like taxi drivers and car drivers. Mm -hmm. They still have to mm -hmm. come to you. Uh, you know, previous, uh, of course, you can digitize some of the process. You can meet online, mm. you can have meetings at all. But how do you check whether a car is, uh, you know, still uh, roadworthy, for example? How do you check a car is safe? Uh, for mm, your, yes, for you're your right. You have, you have, you uh, have you making know, you a good point here. Yeah. Uh, so you probably have to ask your, your drivers to go to Puspacom and do some checkup and get the certification. Mm. Puspacom can't do it digitally. They can't digitally inspect your car. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so there will be physical elements Oops. to it. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> you so, just keep... You just keep my head over oh, something. Yes, yeah, it's true. So, it's true. I mean, even if you're a digital startup, right? A tech startup, oh, yeah. a digital startup, mm. uh, there will be, I think, physical uh, components of the business which you can't mm. digitize. Uh, it has mm. to be done. Uh, but mm. it's just that then how you then make it as efficient as possible. Uh, you make the processes as efficient as possible. A little bit of physical stuff, just get mm. that done. Uh, in the current situation, of course, everything has to depend on SOP. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. then, you know, if the government suddenly don't allow you to do that, then you're stuck, right? If the government says push park on close, nobody can go there for checkup. Then how do you uh, verify a car, for example, uh, certify a car? So things like that. Uh, so definitely there will be uh, some issues uh, when it comes to government SOPs, uh, which is why a lot of businesses, I think, were affected, right? In the last two years, I think we saw a lot of SMEs were, were heavily affected, uh, mm -hmm. not just because of the market, but because of government, uh, you know, uh, SOPs, right? There were a lot of SOPs and lockdown-related issues. 
where we just can't do anything, right? If the government says you can't do this, you can't do it, right? Uh, yeah, so for those kind of things, some of those things we just have to just wait and, you know, uh, wait for things to improve so that we can go back and start doing business again. Uh, but whichever processes, whichever parts of our organization that we can digitize, we digitize so that mm -hmm. we can keep, you know, uh, running the business. So I think but right. it's very subjective, very subjective. Yeah. It really depends on your business and your industry. Okay, points. Um, right. Um, now, what about companies that are those feel like those uh, proud, those groups that have made it all the way um, through their transformation and they're shifting now to digital optimization. So they have gone through the transformation. Now they are seeing that there's many ways to further fine tune this bad boy. So how can they continue to optimize and what should their shift the priorities be? Uh, priorities. I think, I mean, optimization is the way to go, right? I mean, as long as you mm. have that culture mm. of optimization, uh, like I said, even strategy, right? How do you optimize the strategy? Uh, you know, you must have a, you know, like a regular period where you reevaluate your strategies, you, you know, mm. re-strategize. Uh, so as an organization, you may want to do it every three months, I mean, every quarter, or you want to do it every six months, or you want to do it annually, but that depends on the business, right? Uh, different organizations mm -hmm. have different style. Uh, and also depends on how big they are, right? Some businesses are too big, they can't simply change. They can't change every three months, right? Uh, but some businesses, smaller businesses like, you know, SMEs like us, uh, for me, I can change anytime because I'm a, I run a very small team, I have a small business, and I can make decisions and change anything anytime. Uh, so depends on the, on the business. But I think as long as you have that culture of always wanting to optimize, uh, then I think that's, that's already good. Uh, because you know, as long as you hit that your time, you time to reevaluate, uh, reoptimize, or re-strategize, you will keep improving. But if you do the culture where you know you just introduce something new and then say, okay, the next ten years we're gonna just use this, uh, then you'll get stuck, right? Uh, because mm -hmm. things are evolving around us. You know, the market is always changing. Uh, people are always mm -hmm. changing. Our customers are always changing. Uh, I mean, look at ten years before, right? Uh, how we are doing digital marketing now. Ten years before, a lot of these things didn't exist. Uh, you can't sell things on TikTok, right? TikTok didn't exist. Mm. And now people are making, uh, I think, billions on TikTok, uh, just selling products and services through TikTok. Uh, so a lot of these things change. The, you know, the world keeps changing around us. So if we don't have this culture of always looking at, you know, what's changing around us and trying to adapt and re-strategize, then we'll be left back. Uh, and we have seen those things, right? A lot of businesses, even big brands, have been left behind. Uh, and some of them couldn't survive the pandemic, for example. Uh, many big brands have shut down. I think in the last two years, you would have noticed, right? A lot of international mm. brands have shut down. Yeah. A lot of big uh, companies have either, you know, just rebranded or just had to mm, sell yeah. off. Uh, but I think the smaller ones, maybe, yeah, like I said, easier to adapt, easier to re-strategize. Mm. You, mm -hmm. you can always pivot, right? You can always pivot into something new. You have a team, mm. you have resources, uh, you have an office, you have staff. Mm -hmm. uh, from doing, I think even in the startup ecosystem, we've seen a lot of pivot last year. A lot of startups have changed totally from one business to another business. They still use the same team, the same staff, the same skills, uh, but from business A, they just shift to business B because they have to make money to survive, right? In order to pay exactly. their staff. Uh, so we've seen that a lot in the startup ecosystem as well. I think startups are always known for that because you know mm. the whole idea of startup is a business mm. that is constantly evolving. Uh, the whole mm. idea of starting yeah. a startup, Correct. launching a startup, is to constantly evolve and keep solving problems and keep adapting to the market mm. around you. So pivot is a—it's actually a very popular thing amongst in the startup ecosystem, right? Exactly. Uh, a lot of startups yeah. constantly pivot all the time in order to 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 fit into the market. Uh, so I think a lot of them have successfully uh, pivoted last year during the pandemic. SMEs mm. may be a bit tough because they're not used to it. Mm. You know, they're not used to just pivoting to a business to a whole new different business or even digital transformation. I think it's a, a huge challenge for a lot of our SMEs. Uh, but you know, I just hope for the best, lah, right? That they 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 can do and also able to survive this. Great, um, great. Yeah, uh, Imbaraj, I think uh, um, we have talked a lot about all this issue. Um, I think it's a time to uh, open up for Q and A to take a look at the message. Right. Um, I have one question from the registration. All right. Um, right. Uh, let me see. What is the question? What is the main sustainability challenge that faces the creative industry nowadays? This is from the registration. Sustainability challenge. Eh? Uh, I would say for my case, 
uh, we don't have a lot of the issues internally, as in to run my business, right? Uh, sustainability is not an issue. Uh, I mean, because we are, has always been very lean. We've always been digital. So, you know, in terms of like, you know, wastage and all that, it's very minimal. Uh, even like uh, things like power use, like electricity, our carbon mm -hmm. footprint, I would say, is, is very small. Uh, but the challenge comes when we're doing work for clients. Uh, for example, like you said earlier, right? Printing t shirt. <laughs> uh, is it <laughs> yeah. sustainable? Right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because last time when you do an event, you need to have a goodie bag. Mm -hmm. You need to have a goodie bag, you need to have a notepad, pen inside, things like that, right? There's a lot of plastic packaging. Uh, or when you do catering, if you do an event and there's 200 people there, uh, when you mm -hmm. need to give people food, uh, then you have to look at you know your disposable uh, plates and cups and things like that. Uh, but the other challenge is one thing if you want to be fully sustainable, right? Uh, but then the COVID situation also poses that issue. Uh, if I want to be, for example, I, I take a very simple example, right? If I'm doing an event, I need to cater food. The most sustainable way is a buffet system where everybody uses a plate and a cup, you eat, and then you give it back to the caterer, they go back and wash it and reuse it, right? Uh, no wastage, no paper cups and plates or plastic uh, things to dispose. But now because mm. of the pandemic, you can't do buffet anymore, right? You have to do individually yeah, yeah. <laughs> food. Because that is a requirement of the current situation because of the mm. pandemic because of the infection thing you have to individually pack food so now if you are individually pack food how do you properly pack food without any plastic in it right uh, mm. even if you look at a lot of our packaging like paper packaging for example if you want to put food or liquid inside there will be a plastic coating inside which makes them uh, not recyclable so if you i think mm, a lot of people true. know this right paper cups for mm. example paper cups more are not plastic usage in fact is more more plastic usage you know if you put it this way yes. Because paper cups are not uh, recyclable, for example, right? They're paper cups, mm. but they come with a plastic lining inside. Uh, mm. If you look at even paper uh, packaging for food, right? Uh, the paper box where you want to put your noodles or rice food mm. inside, mm. there's also a plastic coating inside, which makes them non-recyclable. Uh, and mm. then there's biodegradable uh, wear, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. But then now your cost goes up. Uh, so these kind of challenges, very challenging. Uh, mm. And then how do you, you know, send a gift back to someone? Uh, so when you look at those kind of things, yes, definitely very challenging. You have to kind of balance it because on one side, you want to be sustainable and you want to, for example, ESG, right? If you look at ESG, now that is the, the, the buzz now. Uh, all mm. our corporate clients, for example, mm. are looking into ESG ratings. Uh, they want to have a good ESG index. They want to make sure they, want, they reduce uh, wastage and uh, they're into this whole sustainable agenda. But at the same time, we need to get work done. <laughs> so when you want to get work done, now how do you balance it? Yes, I want to have all this sustainable agenda. At the same time, I want to feed you. So now it's a <laughs> yeah. for me to yeah. feed you. We have, we have to be a bit more realistic. Today. Sometimes that's yes, your right. Okay. Yes, Imbaraj, I, have another question. Something, right? I mean, even mm. selling products, uh, not all products can be easily mm. packaged with sustainable packaging. Some mm -hmm. products has to be put in a plastic container, right? Uh, I mean, you wouldn't buy a shampoo folded in a paper, right? Uh, the shampoo has to come in a plastic container. Uh, of course, mm. now people are then working on like biodegradable plastic and all that. But I think mm. the technology is not there yet, right? It's true, Still yeah. In working progress. Plastic is here to stay, you know, never go away. Right. Um, Imbaraj, I have another question from the audience as well today. Um, do you think the digital transformation will permanently change our working style from home in office to work from home? So I think we have talked about that. So do you want to have a further remark? pertaining to that? Uh, I think working from home is great when it's a necessity. But if you ask me personally, my view based on my experience and also uh, my view after like talking to a lot of other entrepreneurs, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think everybody realizes that productivity has dropped. Uh, I think it's not easy to maintain the same level of productivity when you're working from home. Uh, unless your job is very silo, right? I mean, if you, let's say you go to office and you're, you work alone, mm -hmm. Uh, then maybe for someone like that, that kind of role, you can do the same thing at home. But if let's say your work requires you to interact with a lot of people, you have to work in a team, for example, right? Yeah, where you have a team, you have a team lead, you have colleagues, where you have to sit in an in a office space and, and collaborate and work together. Uh, those kind of roles, it's very hard to replicate uh, virtually or uh, from home. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you're from home, you don't, you can get done, right? Like I said, as a necessity, you still can get the work done. But your productivity will definitely drop. So something may, which probably will take uh, one day, now may take three days to complete. Uh, something that may take one hour to complete, now may take three to four hours to complete, right? Uh, so I'll give you an example, something simple like uh, 
designing a, a poster right for social media uh, if i'm in an office with my team i could just jump to my 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 graphic designer's computer and just point at the screen and say hey i wanted to move this left right put this in add a word we are done right but if i'm doing it virtually now my graphic designer has to do it from home send it to me i have to view it and then i have to you know mark it on my my screen or my phone mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. i have to type out instructions so now i have to spend more time typing out all the instructions and then sending it to my staff right uh, and then my mm-hmm. staff has to understand what i just said if not there will be a lot of uh, you know back and forth back and forth uh, things mm-hmm. like that uh, my video has gone off right yeah 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 let me just I think it's the battery. Back. okay yeah you're back online <laughs> okay so that yeah like i was saying yeah okay great um i think this is great um um we we um whatever you said i think there was uh, quite valid and uh, exactly uh, thanks for the re-emphasize um right um i can't believe our time is flying so fast but i do have one last question for you that is how do you as actually measure if your digital transformation was successful So what are some of the key performance indicators which is the KPI aside from um aside from the fact that the last project is take off the list for instance is done. So what are some of those the KPIs we can see that we have achieved something here for instance. What is your what is your uh, advice? Uh I think for me uh, as a small SME uh for me the the main KPI is always the revenue. Uh, mm-hmm. As long as you know the revenue mm-hmm. comes in then you know you're doing something right uh, mm-hmm. so for example last year when we had the first lockdown the first four months there was mm-hmm. almost zero revenue right very minimal mm-hmm. time minor yeah. because like like i said right we were already digital uh, you no know, we were doing like digital marketing campaigns a lot but many of our clients were not digital so although we were ready we were like oh digital let's go but the clients were like no we are stuck now we can't do things we can't do business we can't sell things so now we can't do digital marketing now we can't give you money to do digital marketing because we can't sell something physically uh so there were a lot of issues like that right so the first few months it was just stuck right uh, i think we were all just dealing with the pandemic and just trying to stay safe stay at home and not being able to run business so even even for me personally uh i decided to just take some time off uh i didn't straight away jump and you know do something else uh, mm-hmm. i'm like hey i'm already digital i'm ready but my clients are now not able to get on board so revenue has to stop right so uh, most of our revenue stopped uh, we lost a lot of projects as well so in last year march we had a lot of new contracts to kick off for for last year so i lost a lot of projects which is worth quite a lot uh, so then you know i just took some time off i was re-strategizing looking at how we can do this so either you know you do something totally new or you just wait and you know wait it So for me for my business I realized uh, a lot of things are built I can't just throw it away. Uh so I said okay we'll just hold on right we try to hold exactly. on for four months. Yeah so mm-hmm. we hold we, so we held on for four months we, I kept the team so my priority of course was to keep the team uh my staff on board uh make sure they still get paid uh and we can do something very minimal any small projects that we can do just to survive uh and then just wait it mm-hmm. out. So about four months nothing and then the moment the lockdown ended we bounced back uh you know the clients started calling again uh and then that's when we had to then look at like for example our events right because our digital marketing and all that ready to go we are digital uh, but things mm-hmm. like our corporate innovation programs our startup programs uh, those were still physical so that one we had to now find out new ways so we had to quickly adapt uh, find new ways to to transform all the things into digital so that we can still mm-hmm. go to client and say hey we can still do this for you you want to do a program yes we do it virtually now and this is the cost to do it let's go uh so that's what we did i think in that sense so we made sure the revenue continued coming so although in the first part of the first half of the year we were stuck but the second half of the year we bounced back so we we still made uh, all that most of the revenue that we we missed 
Uh, so end of the year, when we reevaluate, we're like, all right, that's our KPI, right? We hit the revenue that may not be what we uh, aspired, our target, uh, but it was still comfortable enough that, you know, we, we survived. So that then we can go into 2021 and we are still here. Uh, yeah, but sure. Yes, then, yes. Uh, but of course, then January this year, when the year started, with a lot of promise, but January we went to another lockdown. <laughs> so then, <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think I think sustaining is important. So how do we sustain along the way? I believe uh, there's always there's a way out. Okay, Imbaraj, this is a great thank you so much for giving us the time today and for sharing all of your expertise. So well thought out, and it gave us a lot of to think about as well. It's likely spears some more questions, uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if you and I may be met up again and have another conversation around some of these follow-up questions that I'm sure will be coming our way. Awesome. Thank you so much once again, Imbaraj. I appreciate right. it. Thank you so much thank for having for me. Being, thank you for being, on, uh, being with us. Spotlight Dialogue Series organized by Special Interest Group in Creative Economy at Integrated Sustainability and Urban Creativity Center from Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation, APU. Um, apologize for earlier on, we supposed to start at 12 o'clock because of the technical uh, error in curse, so therefore we have delayed for another half an hour. So thanks for staying with us and thank you for the audience so much. Until then, take care and each other have a nice weekend.